Good evening. Tonight, President Trump's legal team is bracing for the big one, the moment when Russia's special counsel Robert Mueller says he'd like a word or two on the record with the president. Now, the last time something like this happened was in 1998 to President Clinton. He lied to Ken Starr's grand jury, and it obviously did not end well. This would not, however, be the first time for Donald Trump. As a private citizen, he gave plenty of testimony, not all of it the whole truth or even close. We'll talk about that tonight. This weekend, the president said he's a genius, a very stable genius, in fact. We'll have more on that. Also, the damage control over the Michael Wolff book continues, including Steve Bannon now backing away from some of what he's quoted as saying in the book, as well as the uh, slavish defense offered by one of the president's top advisors to Jake Tapper on Sunday. He then refused to leave when asked and was escorted out of the studio by security. It was that kind of a weekend, and it is still only Monday. We begin with CNN chief political analyst Gloria Borgia, who has the Trump Mueller story. So what are your sources telling you about a possible interview between the special counsel and President Trump? Well, lawyers for Donald Trump are anticipating that they're going to get this request uh, for an interview, as one might expect. And there have been no substantive discussions on the matter yet. But uh, his his attorneys, as you would also expect, have been talking about this amongst themselves for months about how they would handle any request from the special counsel to talk to the president. Because as you can imagine, Anderson, they're going to try and put as many parameters around it as they possibly can to try and protect their client. What I mean, what limits if any, could the, the legal team impose? Well, they can ask. <laughs> they can ask. It's not clear what Mueller would say to them, but they could say, look, does this have to be under oath, for example? Can you give us written questions to which we would reply with written answers, as happened with Ronald Reagan in Iran-Contra? Does this have to be recorded? Um, there, can we have an informal interview rather than a formal interview? So there are, there are all kinds of things they're thinking about. They're looking at precedent, at Reagan and uh, at George W. Bush uh, with, with, uh, Iran, with Iraq. So they're at the 9-11 Commission. So they're trying to kind of look at all these things and say, well, how can we respond to what is going to be an inevitable request from the special counsel? Has the, the president's legal team spoken on the record about this? Yeah, well, they, they have, and they have very, uh, very little. Uh, Ty Cobb, who has been representing, uh, who is the internal special counsel uh, for the president inside the White House, said this today. He said, for the record, the White House does not comment on communications with the Office of Special Counsel out of respect for the OSC and its process. The White House is continuing its full cooperation with the OSC in order to facilitate the earliest possible resolution. And Anderson, you know, they would like to get this over with as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, you mentioned Bill Clinton earlier. They went through months of litigation on this, and they finally wound up with Clinton before uh, a grand jury. And I don't think that's what Trump's lawyers want at all. I think they'd rather get this over as quickly as possible and yeah. try and find a way to accommodate what Mueller wants with what they believe would be in the best interest of their clients and get it done. All right, Gloria, stay with us. I want to bring in legal reinforcements, Jeffrey Tubin, Kerry Cordero, and Professor Alan Dershowitz. Professor, uh, if you were advising the president or his team, what would you advise them about this? Well, the, the dread would be if he got a subpoena to appear in front of the grand jury. No lawyer present, no opportunity to know the questions in advance. Donald Trump, unscripted, uncontrolled. That's the, the last lawyer's thing want to climb. nightmare, right. an uncontrolled Donald Trump in a grand jury room. They'll do anything to avoid that. He's not going to plead the fifth, so he has to answer the questions. So they'll accept anything short of that. Uh, interrogatories, uh, questions, written questions, maybe an informal interview. But remember, if you lie to a law enforcement official, even not under oath, right. That's a serious federal crime. So Mueller has the leverage here, the legal leverage, because he can threaten the grand jury subpoena. But what I think ultimately they would prefer, the defense attorneys, is to make all kind of proposals for Mueller and then Mueller turn them down and not invoke a grand jury subpoena. So they can then say, well, we offered to cooperate, but Mueller didn't accept it. I don't think that's going to happen. I mm. think there's going to be a compromise or else he'll be called in front of a grand jury. Jeff, how do you see this in terms of, uh, you know, how much leverage they have? 
Well, I, I think both sides have have a lot of leverage. I mean, obviously, as Alan said, there is the possibility of a grand jury subpoena, but that could lead to uh, mon- months uh, of litigation. You know, I think Trump is at less risk than most people think here because of the unique circumstances of these kind of questioning. I mean, Anderson, you have interviewed Donald Trump. We have all seen him answer questions. When you ask him a question, he will talk for 40 minutes in response. And and he in, in, in the grand jury or in any of these circumstances, there's no judge to tell him to stop. So I think whatever circumstances he winds up in, he's just going to filibuster. He is going to talk about what he wants to talk about. He's going to say there was no collusion over and over again. And I think it's going to be very difficult uh, for Mueller and his team to pin the president down. He's testified many times. Uh, and and I, I just think um, he is at less risk. Um, than perhaps Allen does uh, under these circumstances. Although, I mean, Kerry, uh, to, to Jeff's point, uh, you know, every lawyer I've ever talked to, if you're going to testify, tells you just answer the question, be as brief as possible, don't elaborate on things. To Jeff's point, if he does elaborate on stuff, isn't that a danger for, for the president? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a danger for the president and there's also for a, a danger, um, sort of a legal risk for other individuals who have already been interviewed by the special counsel's office who might be campaign aides or individuals who work in the White House. When he does end up having to um, conduct an interview with the special counsel's office, the question with respect to whether he tells the truth and whether or not um, his statements are truthful will have an effect not only only as to whether or not he then is uh, liable in some way for giving false statements to investigators, but also his statements will be compared to information that others have given. So so those statements will be compared. And so his truth telling is important, not just for him, but as well as for others. Yeah, I mean, you know, Pro- Professor uh, Tim O'Brien uh, was sued by Donald Trump when he was a citizen. Sure. Uh, he was working in The New York Times th- at that point, And they deposed Donald Trump. And according to Tim... A number of inconsistencies, false statements came out in the president's uh, deposition. When when President Clinton testified, he was allowed, uh, if memory serves me correct, to be in his lawyer's office. It was done by remote and his lawyers were actually present. So those are the kind of things they can negotiate. They can negotiate those kinds of things. But I do think that any president who goes on and on and on raises the odds that he'll say something that's not true. Now, he's been deposed, but, you know, you don't normally get indicted for lying under deposition. You should. Mm -hmm. People should be indicted for lying under deposition, but they're not. But if you're the president of the United States, every line will be scrutinized. He doesn't know what other people have told Mueller. And so he will be surprised by some of the questions, and he will have to spontaneously answer. Now, if he's in a grand jury, he can say, time out. I don't want to answer that question. I want to talk to my lawyer and get advice. But knowing Donald Trump, is he going to do that? Or is he going to just go ahead and answer the questions? If I'm a lawyer, I want control over my client. And but anything they do will be an attempt to get control over the situation. You know, but but and, the, the unique... I'm sorry, go ahead. Gloria. And Anderson, they, ahead. they may try and kind of narrow or try to narrow the scope of the questions. For example, we're not going to ask about collusion, but maybe we're going to ask about obstruction. Mm -hmm. And um, it really all depends, and you guys are the legal experts here, I'm not, but in talking to lawyers, it seems to me that it also depends upon the the content of what they want to ask Trump specifically about. Because if it's obstruction, it goes to his state of mind, doesn't it, at the time uh, that he fired Comey? Yeah, and Gloria, that was my next question, and I'll I'll ask it to Jeff. I mean, if, um, you know... If the president wants it to only be on the subject of collusion and not any financial issues, that's obviously something I guess they could try to negotiate. But, Jeff, what is this, the timing of when this interview takes place, what does it tell you about the status of the Mueller investigation? Because wouldn't Mueller want to talk to the president toward the end of an investigation after all the information has been collected? So, So because the chance of calling the president back, I assume, would be limited would be would be remote in the extreme it is true i think you're absolutely right Mm -hmm. that um the the Mueller team will want to interview uh trump towards the end but remember i mean gloria's reporting says they have not yet started the final negotiations about 
uh, when this interview will take place. So, I mean, we, we, are, we are not yet seeing officially the, the, the Mueller office saying, this is it, we're ready to do it tomorrow. So, you know, remember, this is an investigation where they have a trial coming up in May, uh, you know, of, of Manafort and Gates. I, I you know, and, and the White House, you know, every single time Ty Cobb speaks to the public, it's always about we want a prompt resolution. We think things are wrapping up. He said Thanksgiving. He said the end of the year. Here we are. We have had no signal from the Mueller office that they are wrapping up. We have a lot of uh, hopeful comments from um, White House uh, lawyers saying we think they're wrapping up, but that's not the same yeah. thing as an actual uh, conclusion or near conclusion of this too, investigation. That the, ultimately, Mueller has the authority to not negotiate. Mm -hmm. He has the authority to yep. simply send out a subpoena with no limitations, no compromises, asking him about anything from obstruction. Now, of course, the president can file a lawsuit, but that and maybe delay it, but that flies in the face of the commitment by his lawyers that they want it to be done quickly. So I do think Mueller has the leverage advantage here, but he doesn't want to seem like a bully, and he doesn't see, want to seem like he's doing something that interferes with the operation of the presidency. Boy, I, so I Alan, think in you know, practice, I, I, I will, think. Yep. I'm sorry. I just I think the leverage uh, the president has plenty of leverage here. What is look it? at how much the Republicans have been attacking Mueller. He could turn this into Mueller overstating, you know, Mueller over over, uh, you know, demanding too much, uh, doing, you know, uh, break, breaking promises. I mean, this will not be a one sided political argument. And the president and his party are already lined up against Mueller. So the idea that that the president is obligated uh, to give in to uh, Mueller here, I, you know, I just don't Why think that is politically Why doesn't Mueller just right. say every American has an obligation to testify fully and completely in front of the grand jury? We're not going to treat the president any differently. We're going to send him a subpoena. He has to testify. His lawyer can be outside in the room. That's the way we treat everybody who's a witness in America. No one's above the law. Why isn't that a perfect answer, Jeffrey? The, the, the reason is uh, we have a constitutional system where the president is the executive branch and mm -hmm. he has different pa and, and he has different responsibilities. And it has never been said, you know, whether it was a civil case, Clinton v. Jones, the president Nine is nothing. in a unique place with regard to the constitutional system. And I don't see uh, that the president will be intimidated Jeffrey, by that argument. that's my argument. I've been making that argument for months, that the president's in a unique place. He has the executive authority. But the one thing I don't think he would ever do was would be interfere with a grand jury subpoena requiring him to behave like every other American does. Right. But we'll see. Yeah, we got to we, we got to take a quick break. I want to hear from uh, from Gloria and Kerry when we come back more on the possibility of President Trump testifying under oath. And also later, is Oprah Winfrey for president something real after her speech at the Golden Globe Awards or just a brief flare in a cold winter? We'll have more on that ahead. In need of great talent for your business, but short on time? You don't have to get lost in a huge stack of resumes to find your perfect hire. You just need the right tools, smarter tools. It can be challenging finding great talent to make your business successful. ZipRecruiter posts your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. Then ZipRecruiter actively looks for the most qualified candidates and invite them to apply. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. ZipRecruiter the smartest way to hire. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. One more time. To try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. Back now with our panel. If President Trump does, in fact, testify under oath, it wouldn't be the first time. In fact, as a real estate developer, he was deposed many times over many years, and his track record was, to say the least, uneven. Jeff Tubin, Kerry Cordero, Gloria Borger, and uh, Alan Dershowitz uh, are joining us right now. So, Kerry, you know, and one of the things that's so fascinating, and this was alluded to in our last discussion, is that Mueller is really holding all the cards in terms of information, that the president doesn't know what Mueller knows, doesn't know what the all the emails that that Mueller has had access to. So for something like the the Trump Tower meeting with Donald Trump Jr. and Paul Manafort and people who claim to be working for the Russian government offering dirt on Hillary Clinton, there may be a whole slew of emails about that meeting that the president has no idea about. 
Well, there's certainly more that the special counsel's team knows than the president and the White House know. But the White House knows more than we know. And so they have been in talks with the special counsel's office. For example, several months ago, they had written some memos that they submitted to the special counsel's office trying to argue why the president um, shouldn't be subject to an inquiry into obstruction, for example. And so they have, I think, behind the scenes been trying to weed down the investigation. The issues with respect to the interview are first a format, what the things we were talking about before the break, what will be the format of the interview, who will conduct it, who will be able to be be there with the president, um, those types of things. And then the second goes to an issue that Gloria mentioned before the break, which is the substance. Will the substance of the interviews, assuming they take place, only pertain to obstruction, Mm -hmm. only pertain to um, issues related to cooperation, or if we want to call it collusion with the Russian government in terms of their meddling in our election, or even possibly an aspect that might be going on that we know probably the least about, inquiries into uh, Trump organization financial issues. And so those substantive issues um, would mean very different things for the president if he was interviewed. And Gloria, yeah. I mean, what's so interesting about that is the president is already on the record with the New York Times when asked if that was, if the you know, financial issues going back years or decades is it was a red line for him. And he said it, it was a red line. So the idea right. of him being questioned about financial issues or banking issues that's obviously something, he- and that would, and I think that would come as a shock to the to to his attorneys who have said over and over again that they see no indication that that is what the special counsel is honing in on. But we don't know. But the White House does have an idea, I believe, of what people inside uh, Trump world have testified mm-hmm. to Mueller. You know, don't forget, Ty Cobb has been in the White House, sort of producing all the documents that were sent over to the special counsel's office. Uh, He has been helping coordinate the interviews between people inside the White House, like Hope Hicks or White House counsel Don McGahn or former White House chief of staff Reince Priebus. And uh, it would seem to me that he would have gotten a readout of what uh, those people were testifying to to the special counsel. So I think they have sort of a, a general knowledge of part of the body of work that the special counsel has in front of it as far as what th- they know about. And, and, they, <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, Professor, uh, you and I were talking about this during the break. I mean, this whole issue of the president's stability, which has been raised by, by his critics, um, obviously they... The people who believe he is not in some way stable would welcome this kind of an interview because the very notion, if they believe he's not stable, that he might say something or reveal something. I think that's right. And they will look at everything he says and try to use that as proof of their statement. Look, I taught psychiatry and law for a quarter of a century. I wrote the standard case book co-edited on psychiatry and law. The first rule is you never diagnose somebody that you haven't met and haven't analyzed and haven't examined. The only thing more dangerous than criminalizing political differences is pathologizing them. That's what the Soviet Union did to dissidents. It's what the apartheid South African regime did with the Chinese regime. We should not go down that line of giving psychiatrists the power to use their political opposition to try to create a diagnosis. If you don't like a president vote against him. And believe me, they'll go through every line of testimony. Somebody on your network just earlier today said he has Alzheimer's. You should check the statements he made now against what he said 10 years ago. Well, check the statements I made now against statements I made 10 years ago. I was a little brighter 10 years ago than I am today. That's what happens when you get old. But the idea of trying to pathologize political differences is so dangerous to democracy. Jeff, I know you wanted to say something. Well, I I just want, I mean, I thought Kerry did a very good job of talking about, you know, the different variables that could be um, in in place in in regarding Trump's testimony. But I think there's one she left out that's very important, which is simply how long the testimony will go. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. when George W. Bush uh, agreed to speak to the 9-11 Commission, he gave them an hour, one hour. I mean, I think we all underestimate Donald Trump's ability to run out the clock. Mm-hmm. He could get one question and talk for 40 minutes. And it's very hard to interrupt him. I mean, you've interviewed him, Anderson. You know how hard it is to interview him. And he wasn't even the president of the United States then. You know, I, I think 
um, the president is in a lot better shape regarding this interview uh, than perhaps others do here. Yeah. Uh, I think the idea that he is going to be pinned down by an email uh, when, you know, he doesn't use email, so it won't be his email. People wrote about him. You know, I, I just think um, he is uh, a very experienced customer. He's president of the United States. It's very hard to tell a president to shut up when you don't, when there's no judge in the, in the room. I just think he's in better shape than we're giving him credit for. Um, Jeff Tubin, thank you. Carrie Cordero, Gloria Borgia, Professor Dershowitz, always good. Thank you very much. There's a new report tonight on what appears to be the president's shrinking workday, even as his spokesman says he's working tirelessly for the country and everybody knows it. Keep him uh, honest. Coming up next, what freshly obtained documents of his private schedule have to say about that. Want more than just the headlines? Join me, Don Lemon, on CNN Tonight for a no-holds-barred breakdown of all the day's top stories. CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, weeknights at 10 Eastern on CNN. Welcome back. Let me start this Keeping Amana segment by getting one thing out of the way. Here at 360, we are all in favor of people watching more cable news whenever they like, as much as they like, and that goes for everyone, even the President of the United States. Not that he does watch a lot of cable news. In fact, here's what he tweeted back in July. Quote, the White House is functioning perfectly, focused on health care, tax cuts, reform, and many other things. I have very little time for watching TV. That tweet went out at 9.39 a.m. Eastern Time. The president tweets a lot in the morning, especially about what he is watching on cable news programs, sometimes within minutes of the segment in question. Now, apparently that tweet wasn't enough for the president. So back in November, he told reporters, quote, I don't get to watch much television, primarily because of documents. I'm reading documents a lot. Now, it's not exactly news that the president is doing precisely what he says he's not doing, but now we have a more detailed look at the president's schedule. The website, Axios, got a look at copies of the president's private schedule. Every morning, he has a three-hour period called executive time. According to the documents Axios has, executive time is from 8 to 11 a.m. Now, during executive time, you might think he would be in the Oval Office or elsewhere in the West Wing doing executive stuff. Instead, according to Axios, this is the last place you will actually find him. Officials telling Axios that executive time almost always means TV and Twitter time alone in the residence. So if that's true, he starts his work day around 11 and usually wraps up at 6, sometimes even earlier. By comparison, President Obama rose early, worked out, and was at the office between 9 and 10. President George W. Bush began his work day at 6.45, which doesn't mean that this president or any president shouldn't observe whatever schedule they wish. And for the record, this president's workday was, in fact, longer at the beginning of his administration. It's certainly a difficult job, and he's entitled to do it any way he sees fit. However, keep it honest, it does seem a little rich to be tweeting that you don't watch a lot of television at the very moment you're almost certainly watching television. It's a little rich to say that you're just too busy with documents when you reportedly and evidently, judging by all the morning tweets, Spend three hours every morning not reading documents or not only reading documents. It's a little like spending so many days at golf clubs and vacation spots after saying this. I wouldn't leave the White House very much because, you know, like little things like these little trips where they get on, they cost you a fortune. I love working. I'm not a vacation guy. I don't take vacations. I'm not like Obama where he takes Air Force One to Hawaii. I don't take vacations. I promise you, I will not be taking very long vacations if I take them at all. There's no time for vacation. Other people, they go away for weeks and weeks. I don't like taking vacations. Obama likes relaxing and going on vacations. Me, I like working. I like working. I really do. If I get elected president, I'm going to be in the White House a lot. I'm not leaving. We have deals to make. Who the hell wants to leave, right? Well, today a spokesman told us, quote, this president works tirelessly for the American people. He said it aboard Air Force One. If you're wondering where the president was heading at the time on Air Force One, he was on his way first to give a speech in Nashville, then to see the college football national championship. So the question is, is this president a part time president? Perspective now from CNN political director David Chalian and CNN chief political correspondent Dana Bash. So, David, three hours of executive time, according to Axios, for a self-described very stable genius. President Trump's allies might say, you know, what's concerning about that? He's allowed to make his own schedule. And I would agree with those allies. He is allowed to make his own schedule, as you noted uh, in, in what you were just going through, Anderson. Uh, George W. Bush came in at 645, Barack Obama between 9 and 10. Uh, whatever the workflow of the day works for him, I, I wouldn't begrudge him that. I think you highlighted, though, the problem here. It's the, it's the hypocrisy in when you can clearly line up his tweets with what he's watching on television, uh, just like he did when the New York Times reported last month uh, that he watches a ton of cable TV 
TV and then on Air Force One he says to reporters, I don't watch TV at all. It's just blatantly not true because you can match up his Twitter feed to segments he watches on television. And Dan, I mean, it's not like there isn't a history of presidents closely, closely monitoring press coverage. LBJ famously watched TV reports about Vietnam. Uh, one can only imagine about what Nixon would have done if there was 24-hour news during Watergate. I mean, I can't one argue that President Trump's cable TV and Twitter fixation, that the behavior at least partially a product of the times? Uh, I think you could argue partially a, a product of the times, but these times were pretty similar when President Obama was in the White House, and uh, there was no indication that he was as obsessive about cable news uh, and about absorbing and consuming this kind of news as this president is. And, and, and let's be clear, a, a big reason that President Trump is as, uh, as obsessive about cable news is because cable news and all news uh, newspapers and, and, and broadcast news is all about him right now. And so he wants to get uh, a, a sense of what people are saying. His hope, obviously, is to get affirmation. He gets that from watching another uh, cable network, mostly, as opposed to getting facts uh, at, at places like these. But the last time I covered a White House full time, Anderson, was George W. Bush. And his, uh, the, B, the sort of the, the thing that people criticized him for was that he was out to lunch, that he didn't watch enough TV news. And you remember covering Katrina, that he didn't he was accused of not really understanding the impact and the absolute horrors going on there because he didn't turn on a television because that wasn't uh, sort of culturally what he liked to do. I mean, David, you know, in past years when presidents have taken vacation, you know, their supporters have always said, well, look, wherever the president goes, he can work and do business. And, you know, there's uh, secure areas for him to, to gather information and phone calls that, that can be made. Um, so, I mean, I guess that argument could also be made for, the, for this president. Uh, without a doubt. I mean, if he's up in the residence, uh, there's nothing stopping him from directing what's going on downstairs in the West Wing. I, I think that's certainly true. I guess also, Anderson, this shouldn't be terribly surprising. If anybody's been watching Donald Trump over the years of his career in business, this is somebody who has been completely obsessed by his press coverage in ways that I have never seen with politicians, and they're pretty obsessed with their press coverage. But uh, taking out every article and writing personal notes and having his assistant and uh, fax that back or email that back mm -hmm. uh, to a reporter. Uh, th he had a very, in his business career, yeah. uh, a, an obsession with his press coverage. And, and I just don't think that's abated at all. And, and to be fair, not just about his own press coverage, if, David, you're right, but just about news in general. I mean, if you look back at his Twitter feed, of course, that is sort of the, the biggest window we have into what he's thinking and what he's doing. Uh, back way before he decided he was going to run for office, he commented on everything on what was going on in world events, on how the president was doing, from that to what was going on with the kids from uh, from from Twilight. I mean, this is something that he's always done. And there was absolutely no reason to believe that he was going to change that, even and especially when he became president. I actually had forgotten about the Twilight. <laughs> You're welcome, Anderson. <laughs> yes, thank you for the reminder of that. I believe it was dating advice or relationship exactly. advice for some of the exactly. actors and actresses. Another yeah. example of the presidency, I guess, uh, not changing him, but him changing the presidency. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Uh, Dana, David, thanks very much. Up next, could the next presidential election come down to President Trump versus Oprah. Two close friends tell CNN Oprah is, quote, actively thinking about running for president in 2020. The White House has responded to that potential challenge. Details on that ahead. Oprah Winfrey's impassioned speech at the Golden Globes has inspired talk of her running for president in 2020 against President Trump. CNN has learned from three close friends of the media mogul that she is, quote, actively considering it. Here's the moment when she got a standing ovation last night. I've interviewed and portrayed people who've withstood some of the ugliest things life can throw at you. But the one quality all of them seem to share is an ability to maintain hope for a brighter morning, even during our darkest nights. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. And when that new day finally dawns, it will be because of a lot of magnificent women, many of whom are right here in this room tonight, and some pretty phenomenal men 
fighting hard to make sure that they become the leaders who take us to the time when nobody ever has to say me too again. Well, her words were certainly the talk of Twitter and led to the, the, uh, the, attending, the uh, trending hashtag Oprah 2020. This afternoon, the White House responded to the speculation. A spokesman aboard Air Force One said, quote, we welcome the challenge, whether it be Oprah Winfrey or anybody else. Oprah Winfrey has been asked about a potential run for the White House several times since the 2016 election. With a look at that, here's our Randy Kay. Oprah Winfrey, just weeks after Donald Trump won the White House, signaling she may, may be open to running for president in 2020. I actually never thought that that was, I never considered the question even a possibility. I just thought, oh, oh. All right, because it's clear that uh, you don't need government experience to be elected president of the United States, right? I thought, oh, gee, I don't have the experience. I don't know enough. I don't know. And now I'm thinking, oh. The more that idea, Oprah for president, gained traction, the more Oprah pushed back. On CBS This Morning. You You can be safe with that. There will be no running for office of any kind for me. And on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. After Oprah shot down the idea of Michelle Obama running for president, all eyes were on her. Is there any other charismatic African-American woman that both sides of the political aisle... Oprah again trying to end the speculation during an interview with Entertainment Tonight. That is just not going to happen. Okay, okay. Yeah. I just because that would not be my strength. My strength is bringing people together. My strength is connecting people to ideas. Even during campaign 2016, there was already talk of Oprah at the top of the ticket in 2020. After she did a segment on 60 Minutes talking to Michigan voters, an opinion piece in the New York Post read, "She's uniquely positioned." Should she wish to commit herself to seek the Democratic nomination for president and challenge Trump in 2020? Oprah tweeted back a response that only added to the speculation. Thanks for your vote of confidence. Democrats best hope for 2020. That nearly 20 years after Donald Trump told Larry King he would likely choose Oprah as his vice president if he ever were to run. You have a vice presidential candidate in mind? Well, I really haven't gotten quite there yet. Uh, but I guess it's just you Oprah, realize. I love Oprah. Oprah would always be my first choice. Think and if she'd do it, she'd be fantastic. I mean, she's popular. She's brilliant. She's a wonderful woman. I mean, if she'd ever do it, I don't know that she'd ever do it. Meanwhile, now, after her mega speech at the Golden Globes, her longtime partner, Stedman Graham, told the L.A. Times in response to Oprah running for president, it's up to the people, adding she would absolutely do it. And the ladies of The View already hashing it out. This is Donald Trump's worst nightmare. <laughs> Why? Because she will have higher ratings than he will. Believe me, she has had higher ratings. Yeah. She can throw that in his face every single day. I love Oprah. I love the stuff that she's done. I always call her the Oracle instead of Oprah. But don't we already have someone in the White House who has no political experience? And it's not going that well. Oprah 2020. It may have a nice ring to some. But for now, it's all just talk. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. Well, joining me for their take on this, CNN senior media, media correspondent Brian Stelter and CNN uh, political commentator Van Jones. So, Brian, based on your reporting, I mean, how serious or not serious is this? I mean, to have that powerful speech last night and all the speculation today is one thing actually putting together a campaign, taking that step. I mean, that's a huge step. She handcrafted the speech for the Golden Globes. The topic, of course, was the Me Too movement. It wasn't about President Trump. But there were certainly lines in the speech that would work in Iowa and New Hampshire, lines in the speech that could come straight from a stump speech. I think, Anderson, the answer to your question is that Oprah's doing a lot of listening. She has a number of high-powered friends who have been urging her to run for president. These conversations have been going on for several months. I'm told she's not saying she's in, but she's definitely not ruling it out either. She's taking a wait-and-see approach, approach just like lots of potential Democratic candidates in 2020. One source said to me, now, Anderson, she's soaking it all in, listening to all the ideas and thinking about what to do. Van, as you consider this possibility, what, what do you see? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, people would have said Donald Trump could have never been president and he's president. Well, the question is, does she want to be demoted from queen of the universe to president of the United States? That's the only question. If she <laughs> wants to do it, she can do it. 
Uh, she is probably the most beloved human being on Earth. She's probably the most beloved carbon-based life form on Earth. She could, she, if she runs, she will destroy anybody in front of her. The question is, does she want to do it? Um, I've talked to a lot of people who are, who are close to her, who are around her. There's basically, you know, bedlam in Oprah land right now as people, you know, <laughs> people are begging her, please run, please run, please run. Uh, but she's given no indication uh, that she has moved off of, of her position, that she doesn't want to do it. I will say that speech last night was extraordinary. That speech, she, she, she did in nine minutes what Barack Obama did in 17 minutes in 2004. She, she told her story and she told the American story in a way that just was electrifying. Uh, if, she, she, if she decides to do this, it is going to be one of the most extraordinary runs in American history. But, I mean, Vin, you know, the world of politics, you know, it is a dirty business in a lot of ways. And, I mean, to your point, you know, it's a step down for her, you're saying. But to actually enter the fray... You know, things change very quickly. You get bruised, you get battered, you get, you get muddied. Here's the difference with Oprah, though. She's already confessed to everything about her life. Her life is an open book. The only, in fact, the, the tough thing on Oprah might be somebody saying, your life wasn't as bad as you say, or mistakes you made weren't as awful as you felt like they were. I mean, she's uniquely positioned herself to be able to take those those blows and turn them into uh, advantages for herself. Listen, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Uh, part of what happened with Hillary Clinton was that she was not able to get white women to vote for her. The majority of white women voted against her and for Donald Trump. I do not think that is a problem that Oprah Winfrey will have. I think she'll have women. I think she'll have men, blacks, whites, Latinos, business people. I mean, come on. I mean, I, I, I'm just, I got my popcorn. I'm hoping. I'm waiting. I'm watching. Something's going to happen here. I hope. Brian, I mean, if Oprah Winfrey were to get into the primary, could she get some backlash for, for taking up all the media oxygen by virtue of her start? And much like then Kennedy Trump did in, in the 2016 GOP primary. Although, I mean, mm-hmm. frankly, if it was her and Trump, the media coverage of both would, I mean... <laughs> Hard to imagine. Yeah, uh, I don't know right? if there's enough hours in the day for that. Exactly. <laughs> I do think there would be grumbling from other candidates. Look, a lot of the reason why Winfrey's getting calls from these uh, executives, business people urging her to run is because of a sense that the Democratic field is weak, that there are not an obvious, uh, there's not a lot of obvious candidates who have star power and charisma and, and a real opportunity in 2020. I'm sure there's a lot of politicians that would disagree with that statement. But in Oprah's world, there are a lot of people who are concerned about the weakness of the Democratic field. That's why they're urging her to run. And what she would bring is the ability to put on a show just like Donald Trump. She did it in Chicago for decades with the Oprah Winfrey show. That's why, as Van said, so many white women love her as well as black women and many men as well. She appeals to a wide variety, a wide array of people in the country. But she's not commenting. I just want to mention she's not saying anything about this today. I checked in with her company again tonight. They're just letting this trial balloon float up into the air today. Then, I mean, in terms of actual positions that she takes on complex issues, you know, there's not, you know, a lot of that has not been fleshed out by her uh, publicly. So that would be one step that also might alienate some people. You know, it's very easy to say you love Oprah uh, if, but then if she starts to take positions that are antithetical to what... It's conceivable. I mean, she, she'd have to deal with that. Let me just say one thing, though. She could hold together a front against hatred in the country. I think a lot of people are concerned about this growing hatred and intolerance. She could hold together that values-based front for inclusion, for, for tolerance better than anybody else. And second to that, the policies are going to pale. That's what's needed, needed That's in America right now. Uh, Van Jones, Brian Stelter, thanks very much. President Trump gave a speech in Tennessee today before a fired-up audience, mostly devoted supporters. That is next. President Trump did today what he seems to like doing best. He recharged his battery, so to speak, in front of a crowd, telling members of the American Farm Bureau Federation plenty, including precisely what he wanted to hear. Oh, are you happy you voted for me? You are so lucky that I gave you that privilege. Our Gary Tuckman was there as well, talking with members of the president's audience. Thousands of people lining up in the Opryland Resort and Conference Center in Nashville, Tennessee, to see President Trump in person. How do you feel he's doing so far? I'd give him an A, maybe an A+. plus. This isn't a Trump rally. It's the National Convention of the American Farm Bureau Federation. But the people going to watch the president speak are mostly big fans of his. 
This weekend he tweeted, throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being, like, really smart. When you hear that, what does it make you think? Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when he says, like, really smart, if you're really smart, do you need to tweet it and say that to everybody? I don't know. But, you know, people with higher intellectual, intellectual levels than, uh, than me, anyway, they have a different way of expressing themselves, and they can more or less speak above my level. Almost everybody we talk to here wants to defend Donald Trump. Are you a mother? I am. Would you, would you like your kids to tweet, like, I'm really smart? Do you think that would be a good thing for them to do? I probably wouldn't want them to be braggadocious, but... But it's okay if you're president. Well, not really, but... So you do or you don't think it's a good thing for him to do? I want him to be confident. You don't want him to appear braggadocious, but sometimes we need somebody to be braggadocious and do what they say they're going to do. If you are indeed stable and you are indeed a genius, do you need to tweet that? I personally probably wouldn't, but he's very confident in what he's doing. For quite a while now, many supporters of Mr. Trump believe he needs to tweet to get his message out. Despite the fact that as president, he can say what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, and how he wants. How does naming people and giving people names like Crooked and Little and Sloppy, how does that help 322 million Americans? Doesn't bother me. But how does it help Americans when he does it? I'm not saying it helps America, but it really doesn't bother me, and I don't think it bothers the majority of the people in the United States. When he says he's an excellent student, but we've never seen his grades, do you think he's being too pompous, or do you like when he says stuff like that? He's the president of the United States. What does it matter what his grades were? Right, but he's the one who's bringing it up that he was an excellent student, and he says he's a stable genius, and he says he's like a very smart person. Mm -hmm. Should he be talking like that? I think that's fine. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, he's the president. Show some respect. And regarding one other presidential issue freshly in the news, what if Donald Trump ran in 2020 against Oprah Winfrey? Would she get Trump voters? Never. Nope. Okay. Um, I think she's completely lost touch with where she came from. And I think that she has a different agenda than, than Americans. So if she ran for president in 2020, do you know who you would vote for? Oprah Winfrey or Donald Trump? If they ran well, against I don't Trump? know because I would have to see what her platform is, what she would be wanting to do for the country. What, so you would consider what, possibly voting for it, depending on what happens? I, I could consider it, sure. Anderson, President Trump told the audience that he signed two presidential orders to improve rural Internet service. And then he launched into promoting his Twitter brand. He told the audience to make sure you look into it. And it's our way of getting around the media. So he's sticking to that rationale. Anderson. All right, Gary Tuckman. Gary, thanks. A lot more ahead is the groundwork being laid for an interview with President Trump by special counsel Robert Mueller. The new year only eight days old. A lot to unpack. We'll be right back. <laughs> 